Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on the future of work and workers. This is part of a year long series that began uh, in June of 2020, and we're really happy to have all of you joining with us today. And uh, we are 10.01 a.m. here in beautiful Antigonish, Nova Scotia. We are located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And uh, we encourage and welcome all of you to think about the first people in all of your places uh, as you're coming and beaming into us uh, from around the world. And this morning, we are especially pleased to have a number of Cody alumni joining us and sharing their experiences around the future of work and workers, as well as uh, their own experiences uh, with that concept uh, in their locations and communities uh, that certainly do range around the world as well from here in Nova Scotia, in Mi'kmaq, as well as uh, in countries around the world, including uh, India. I see Mansi Ben is here with us this morning. Thank you so much for being with us. And I'm very pleased uh, myself. I'm Jamie Smith, Director of Social Innovation with the Cody Institute. I'm also responsible uh, for the leadership with our Center for Employment Innovation and our Innovation Enterprise Center here on campus at St. Francis Xavier University, uh, whom we work in very close partnership uh, with Cody and St. of X. And we are also very pleased to have Yogesh Gore, our senior program staff uh, and lead for the inclusive economies area of work here at the Cody Institute. And also the strategic advisor of partnerships with the Cody Institute at the leadership team here with us. And we have Farouk Jiwa who is with us, a Cody associate and together Yogesh and Farouk have developed the future of work and workers certificate, uh, which we have some of our alumni here with us this morning, as I've already mentioned. And we have a wonderful opportunity for everyone who's able to connect into the webinar today. Uh, we have been able to keep the certificate applications open for a few extra days. So if you are interested, uh, Brian Lazuri, our manager of communications and marketing is going to put a link to the course for you in there. And we do have a number of scholarships and uh, sponsorship opportunities for that that's going to be taking place in the fall, as well as a number of other certificates. And given the impacts of COVID-19 on our work here at the Cody Institute, our courses at this point in time are still going to be taking place online uh, for the most part. And we do hope that you might be able to join in with us and that you'll have quite a, a bit of inspiration from the alumni that are here with us this morning. So on that note, I will pass it over to Yogesh and Farouk. And again, thank you all for taking your time to be with us. And thank you especially uh, to our alumni, to our friends here who are joining us in conversation on the panel this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, leadership and support in, in getting this, this work uh, off ground at, uh, at the CODI and, and Center for Employment Innovation. Uh, welcome everyone. It's so nice to see everybody. Uh, a lot of familiar names uh, uh, that I see. Uh, welcome. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, so happy to have this conversation on, on future of work and workers uh, with uh, our own graduates of the, of the Cody Institute. Uh, as Jamie said, uh, we started these uh, kitchen table dialogues uh, last year when uh, the pandemic was uh, still looming uh, large on everybody's mind. It, it, it still is, but at that point in time, there were so many unknowns uh, uh, about the pandemic. And as an institute uh, back then, uh, we had to uh, cancel all our programs, uh, all of our existing on-campus programs. We couldn't travel, uh, so we couldn't do any um, uh, on-site courses and we had to, sort of uh, because of no travel, a uh, lot of our work with the partners on ground was also impacted. But as we, as we all know that uh, pandemic uh, accelerated many existing trends uh, around uh, remote work, e-commerce, uh, automation and everything. And uh, one of the things uh, um, uh, that, uh, uh, that happened, and, and we were thinking even as an, as an institute around um, uh, remote learning, online learning, and some of the things that we thought may happen uh, in next five, uh, five years or more that happened overnight. And, and, and uh, we were trying to find out ways to engage with our um, graduates, partners 
all across the uh, uh, world. And one of the ways we started uh, uh, to do that was through these dialogues with our, with our graduates and, and partners. And the topic uh, uh, we chose, again, was very high on everybody's priority, was around future of work. Because uh, at that point in time, uh, we all know that it was, it was a health uh, strategy, uh, um, but the pandemic uh, also was a massive, uh, um, um, had a massive impact on, on jobs, on, on, uh, on, on people's um, work, livelihood, uh, millions uh, lost their jobs. So it, it was very high on, on what the, how the pandemic is going to affect everybody and what is going to be the recovery. So with that, we, we started uh, these dialogues and also, we, we started uh, a course on future of work and workers. We had actually um, originally planned that course even before the pandemic. Uh, but uh, like other things, we had to uh, switch it uh, to online. And few of the things uh, we uh, wanted to explore uh, with that course uh, was looking at some of the key drivers for, uh, for a future of work, like technology, uh, changing demographics, uh, climate change, all of these things we wanted to explore. Uh, uh, and also, uh, uh, what is the role of different stakeholders in, in shaping uh, the future of work? Uh, what is required for reskilling and un upskilling? So all of these host of issues we wanted to explore. And we had a group of uh, 31 participants from uh, 15 countries join us for that uh, uh, initial course one of the first courses that uh, that we launched at the at the Cody Institute and uh, we uh, originally had planned the course for 12 weeks and we ended up uh, uh, running the course for 14 weeks because uh, uh, there was so much interest and we ended up uh, extending it and we had 31 parts, uh, participants um, coming from variety of uh, field uh, some working uh, at the grassroots with with uh, uh, with women uh, youth uh, from that to, uh, to to others working on on global policy making, and uh, and and so they went on on this journey with us uh, with 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 me and 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 Farooq, uh, and uh, they were sort of the uh, the the guinea pigs for us uh, in terms of because this was the first time we were teaching this course. This was a new course. We were combining our our local participants from Nova Scotia, Canada. With a global, uh, uh, with global participants from from Africa and and other places, so it was uh, it was an experiment in many ways. So these thirty one participants, um, they, we went on a journey, and uh, five of them are there with us uh, today. Uh, they have joined us for this uh, for this uh, panel discussion. So we actually want to uh, hear from them. How was that experience? Uh, what did they learn, and and how they are applying that? And, and with that, they will tell us uh, what, is, what is happening in terms of future of work in their organizations and in their community. But before I call uh, our, our, our five uh, participants, um, I want to uh, invite um, the co-conspirator, uh, Farooq Jiva. Please come and, and say hello to everyone, Farooq, and then, then we talk to our, our graduates. Well, thank you, Yogesh and Jamie. It's a pleasure to be back with you again. It's wonderful to see these familiar faces and, and a lot of familiar names as well. Um, yeah, it, as Yogesh has explained, it was a wonderful uh, opportunity for us to develop something new and try it out for the first time last year. As we prepare to do it once, once again, we really wanted to hear from some of the graduates what they learned, but most importantly, what their reflections and, uh, and, and their application of the work has been since then as well. I, I don't want to take up any more time because I'm really keen to hear from our from our graduates what what they were able to learn and more importantly what they've been doing since then. Thank you, thank you, Farooq. So, without uh, uh, any more uh, time, let's uh, get uh, straight into it. So, let me first call on uh, close to home, uh, Alicia Cyril. Uh, uh, Alicia, can you come? Uh, just introduce yourself. Uh, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your organization and then tell us what, uh, what this course did for you and, and how you are applying the learning uh, in your work. Thank you, Yogesh. Um, okay, up first, I guess. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Alicia, and as Yogesh mentioned, um, we all work for different organizations. My, my, uh, me, myself, I work for the YMCA Nova Scotia Works. Our office is in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, in Canada. Um, my official title is career counselor or employment counselor. 
So I work one-on-one -on -one with clients, typically ages 16 or 18 and up. I even had a client once who was 87 years old. Um, so all different age range, but I also volunteer and work with different groups in the community through my job as well, um, youth groups. So with the youth groups, um, I do both group settings and one-on-one -on -one options to help them explore career exploration. Um, I initially took the Cody Future of Work and Workers course because I was seeing a lot of clients who were dealing with anxiety around work. They didn't know what to expect in the future and some of them could see that what their parents or their grandparents had done wasn't going to work for them. They didn't know what the correct choice was. They were seeking advice from friends or family members and they were getting frustrated or confused by mixed responses. And what they all had in common was that they were feeling overwhelmed and anxious about their employment futures. As a career counselor, I wanted to help my clients prepare for the future and to face the future with confidence and hope, not with pessimism and anxiety. And so when I took this course, it really helped me expand my knowledge of where things might be going for the future of work and workers, but it also helped me develop a better understanding of current local and global trends coming from a smaller community with clients who were thinking about moving. Um, it was really important for me to not just understand what was going on at home, but what was going on on a larger scale. So now when I talk to clients, especially youth, I can really focus on relevant skills that they should be developing for now and in the future, like digital literacy and social skills and continuous or lifelong learning. Um, I can talk about what type of work is the norm right now, what they can expect, um, like gig work or entrepreneurship. And I can talk about the importance of things like our digital presence or our digital footprint. Um, most importantly, I can help clients, especially youth, create a mindset that'll help them adapt to changes in the employment sector by focusing on a challenge mindset, by focusing on their strengths, their transferable skills. It helps them be able to pivot with changes instead of being like paralyzed by economic uncertainty um, and the employment anxiety that I was seeing. So yeah, so those are kind of my biggest takeaways from the course and how I'm currently applying what I learned in the course with my clients on a daily basis. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. And, and I think as, as we discussed uh, during the course that skills are going to be the new currency for, for future, uh, future of work. So we would definitely like to uh, talk to you more about how you actually connect with, with youth and talk about different uh, skills and, and your strategies at the local level for reskilling and upskilling. So that'll come, uh, that'll come later. Thank you. Uh, let me uh, uh, go now to uh, Mansi Bin uh, from uh, Seva. <clears throat> Namaste, everyone. Uh, I'm Mansi Shah. I'm a senior coordinator at Self-Employed Women's Association, Seva. Seva is a member-based organization of over 1.9 million poor self-employed women workers from the informal economy. Uh, our members come from over 125 different trades, such as agriculture, laborer, waste recyclers, construction workers, street vendors, uh, artisans, and so on and so forth. Uh, they contribute immensely to the GDP of the country, and yet they hardly have any voice and visibility as a worker. Uh, we at Seva call them the wheels of the pyramid. Um, the, uh, the one of the biggest challenge that these workers in the informal sector face is that um, um, India and um, the country uh, as one, that India is a country of the global south. And uh, secondly, these workers fall into the category called the unorganized sector. Uh, so the, by the time the technological advancements reach this member, it's already too late and the technology has already advanced. Um, uh, the, uh, in 2017, ILO had launched the Global Commission on Future of Work, uh, which uh, uh, recommended uh, 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 which uh, the with the objective of uh, analyzing uh, and the 
uh, analyzing the causes and uh, solutions to develop a future of work which is just dignified and secure for the work all the workers uh, leaving no one behind but uh, the discussions in the uh, in the commission showed that uh, the technology that is being discussed now would take at least 10 years to reach the countries of the global south and then all of a sudden out of nowhere came the pandemic and the future which was supposed to reach the global south countries 10 years later just came in in a uh, in a uh, like a day um, we had no uh, all the global supply chains closed down there was a lockdown and there is no way how you could reach out to the members and it was in this uh, situation that uh, the technology came into picture and that is how uh, we can say that technology is uh, uh, the future of work uh, so we at seva uh, always try to help our facilitate uh, our members in accessing technology which helps them stay current and therefore uh, we had joined the course at uh, with the kodi institute and the course was really an interesting one which uh, through this course we uh, learned uh, several new uh, technologies i mean we had all heard about ai blockchain um, bitcoin all these terms uh, every now and then we are hearing them in our in the news and in a lot of uh, social media context but how does these things work how do they apply to your day-to-day uh, -day activities in your trades that is what uh, in a very simplistic way, in a very uh, uh, easy to understand way was uh, what was uh, explained and conveyed in this course. And it helped uh, us, um, I mean, the, what we would like to now do is convert this course into uh, easy to understand, adaptable, uh, adapted into modules, which can be understood by the grassroots sisters in their own local languages and uh, deliver it to them so that they can also be current, they can keep abreast with the uh, new technological changes that are coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mansi Ben. Uh, yeah, you. Uh, you said uh, the things that we were planning that will come in five to ten years, just like came in, in days and, and and weeks. So pandemic sort of fast forwarded a lot of the things that we were already thinking. But so the future of work is no longer future. It is it is current now. Um, so uh, thank you for that. And we will definitely like to uh, talk to you more about how you are, uh, you know, learning, um, how you take the learning around about new technologies to the grassroots. And 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 what 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 tools you use, what what methods you use to to make this this, uh, I mean, although the technology is is the driver, but how you make it more inclusive. So we would like to to hear more uh, from you about that. Uh, now let me uh, go uh, from India to uh, to Ethiopia. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Tadale, I know your your internet uh, is is uh, um, uh, is is not good at the moment, so. Yeah, if you can just speak, don't uh, let your uh, video be off. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you, Yogesh. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone around the world. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the Saint Xavier University and the Cody Institute for inviting me <laughs> this wonderful conversation. Of course, Yogesh, uh, Jimmy, Farouk, really much appreciated for, for inviting me for this kitchen dialogue. Yeah, my name is Tadel Asfaw. I work for one of the CGIR center uh, in Ethiopia, the International Maze and Wheat Improvement Center. It's a research, a research organization as an administrative and uh, program manager. My organization is particularly focusing and working on the two crops, the maize and wheat crop. Uh, we are providing uh, a variety of these two crops specifically around the world. And uh, we have a number of scientists working and uh, fighting and struggling on a daily basis with this uh, global uh, climate change. So we are providing a new varieties based on the new ecology system. So that's uh, for, for my organization. 
And uh, we had a project working in partnership with the Ministry of Agriculture uh, with GIS and the remote sensing. So we have one practical example, which I would like to just take through, uh, uh, walk through that. So uh, based on this uh, time series data and multiple criteria, our scientists are uh, trained the machine and providing interactive voice recording system to our farmers. So uh, the government of Ethiopia uh, and uh, the Ministry of Agriculture and the research center are expected to, to, pro, to get this updated, up, up to date information from uh, my organization. So uh, we are providing a rest annual rest planning meeting, which is the uh, rest is a disease for particularly wheat, and uh, MLN is a disease for maize. So our scientists are uh, preparing a national consortium meeting and uh, providing uh, ahead of time information for our partners and farmers how they can uh, protect themselves from this disease based on this GIS and remote sensing. Uh, that's uh, the most important uh, element, uh, which is early warning information to the partners. So the second is uh, our farmers and our partners should have a stock for, for uh, the pesticides and the control measure. That's uh, the third one. Uh, the third one is the proactive action to take ahead of time to protect the health of the plant, which uh, we are providing to uh, the government. And the fourth one is, the, uh, again, uh, we are map up to the total maize and wheat production areas and how many of them the total are affecting by this disease so that uh, our farmer are ready and protect uh, the farm, uh, the maize and the wheat lands. And the last one is uh, where uh, develop a wheat and maize varieties that boost production and uh, prevent crop diseases and improve a smallholder farmers. These are the, the major points that uh, my organization is contributing to uh, the partners as well as uh, the government of Ethiopia. Yogesh, uh, Thank you. yeah, this is uh, in short. Thank you, thank you, Tarale. Yeah, I mean, as as a uh, as a research organization with the global uh, outreach, I think it's important to sort of learn about uh, the investments uh, you are you are making in in upcoming technologies and how that is actually uh, disseminated and 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 translated uh, at the uh, for at the grassroots. So yeah, uh, definitely would would love to hear more as we as we go further in this conversation. Uh, now let me let me go to uh, uh, Najmuddin. Uh, first of all, Najmuddin uh, Najmuddin is joining us from uh, Tajikistan, and today is the Independence Day of Tajikistan. So happy Independence Day, uh, Najmuddin! And uh, Najmuddin, uh, although he he took the online course last year, uh, Najmuddin uh, came to Kodi in uh, 2011. So he's a long time graduate. So uh, Najmuddin, over to you. Thank you, Yogesh. Hi, and thank you for congratulations. Hi, everybody. My name is Najmuddin. I am working for Aga Khan Foundation, uh, Tajikistan. And my role is uh, as a technical expert on work and enterprise uh, in the uh, uh, rural program of Aga Khan Foundation, Tajikistan. Aga Khan Foundation is one of the agency of Aga Khan Development Network, or AKDN. AKDN is one of the leading uh, international development organization, which has a network of uh, a uh, private development agency and work mainly in developing countries in Africa and uh, Asia. Uh, it works almost in some 35 countries uh, with, in Africa and Asia with offices in Europe, uh, Canada, and uh, in the US. So AKDN has a wide range of activities in, uh, like involved in development and supporting uh, different sectors in this country, countries, including in health, education, rural development, civil society, uh, promoting economic development, habitat improvement, and uh, also there are different uh, uh, programs on culture, <coughs> culture, uh, culture development. 
So um, in Tajikistan, AKD also works for almost uh, 30 years after getting Tajikistan as an independent uh, countries. And uh, it involves almost all, all these sectors that I, I, I mentioned. It. Uh, for uh, some 10 years, uh, AKF, uh, Aga Khan Foundation, Tajikistan, collaborating with Code International Institute. And first of all, I would like to emphasize our, our fruitful uh, collaboration and to emphasize a bit about the history of our collaboration. It was in 2011, and first time I visited the uh, Code International Institute, I attended a market and livelihood training in Canada. And in that time, uh, I was uh, kind of first participants from these regions. And uh, in that time, in uh, our programming, we just uh, started market development and uh, value chain development approach. And this training was for us very kind of uh, relevant and important. And uh, as we found useful of this training, we, together with support of Farouk and Yogesh, uh, we arranged a kind of tailored uh, training and context of AKF in Tajikistan. So Farouk and Yogesh visited uh, Tajikistan and then we arranged this training in Tajikistan. And this training was provided for our colleagues also from Kyrgyzstan, Afghanistan and uh, Pakistan as well. So four, uh, our colleagues from four countries visited uh, this training in uh, Tajikistan. And this was, I would say, very kind of on time and useful for us. And as a result of this training, after some 10 years right now, we have very good kind of example of uh, kind of good, good value chains that right now we have developed and right now upgrading. For example, we have value chains on cross-border collaboration. We have export-oriented value chains. We have value chain that we built them from very scratch and today they are very successful. For example, we have model of value chain on finance, tourism development, which is a completely new sector for Tajikistan, we have a textile cross-border value chain, which is kind of very unique as well, because it has different elements uh, of cross-cutting, like cross-border with the collaboration with northern uh, part of uh, Afghanistan. And this is almost uh, nine, more than 95% uh, of uh, actors of this value chain are women. And the products that's uh, yeah, developed it. This is Kashmiri products, which is actually exported to US market. And uh, like women in the more terrors, uh, today exporting their products to the export market, which is met international market standards. So this was kind of our first and one of the, our uh, <clears throat> like uh, training that we got from Cody. And based on this kind of knowledge, we also have such kind of result. In addition to this training, we also other our staff attended uh, some seven, eight hour staff also attended different other trainings in Kodi, like in different topics, like in natural resource management, community-based finance, community-led development, women leadership programs. So all kind of this kind of uh, training and capacity building for our staff definitely had their uh, positive impact our program. Right now we have, uh, again, uh, like our recent collaboration is Again, we attending a training on uh, future of work, which was online last year, and three of our colleagues attended this training, and uh, other colleagues also going to attend new upcoming training uh, recently. <clears throat> it says future of work for our uh, program in AKF and Tajikistan and globally. It is kind of new initiatives. Uh, just a few couple of years we just involved on this, and for us also. Uh, a lot of kind of uh, question was there. A lot of things was not not clear about perspective and details of that. So after uh, attending this uh, training um, last year, we already got a lot of kind of uh, information, and now it's kind of clear to understand the importance and priority of future of work for us. The main challenge and uh, opportunities for our targeted beneficiaries that we are right now considering in our program and in our interventions. As in the past experience right now, we sharing this knowledge with our uh, colleagues in the field level, like some people attending right now with others like in the field also, we ourselves are providing this training and sharing this knowledge in order to improve uh, understanding and knowledge in this new kind of uh, train. Myself, myself also is, uh, I'm uh, involved in designing different projects 
project proposal and it helps right now me to provide kind of new innovation and new ideas in the pro project proposal, which uh, makes our uh, project more attractive for uh, funding opportunities. <clears throat> so, uh, based as I mentioned, it based on this knowledge we improving in our our interventions related to future of work and also adjusting our already existing. Uh, the, the strategy of our organization related to future of work. For example, the activities, few example I can bring, like, uh, first of all, it's important, like, uh, to improve understanding of different uh, stakeholders related to future of work. And there is a lot of events raising uh, events, like, for example, we are conducting where we involving different governmental authorities, university and training centers, employers, and uh, even our targeted beneficiaries. And uh, like, for example, we also collaborating with our uh, other academic agencies, like we have University of Central Asia in Tajikistan, which uh, works in Central Asian countries. And with their involvement, they were, for example, conducted several uh, uh, panel discussion related to artificial intelligence uh, on blockchain as a good governance uh, technology. So in this kind of uh, panel discussion uh, involved, they were brought to this discussion in different level of stakeholders, including uh, ministries, private sector, uh, civil society, and other stakeholders. So it helps on the policy uh, dialogue and uh, kind of improving the environment related to future of work. Uh, also in community level, also we are working very, we have very tight kind of collaboration with community-based organization like village organization and uh, other community-based organizations. So through this also we're conducting different kind of awareness trainings, raising uh, activities on job opportunities, needed skills as well, provide them with the information where, for example, they can uh, uh, have this opportunity to improve their skills and to be kind of competitive uh, emplo employees in the uh, labor, labor market. Also other activities, like for example, in the training, we found one of the key or one of the main aspect of future work, this is future skills and gap of skills that right now it's facing, it could be in the future. So related to this, we have already kind of designing implemented different activities. For example, so far, AKF established a coalition of employers. So this platform is established in Tajikistan and also and Kyrgyzstan and basically these experiences that could be replicated in other countries as well. Uh, so here is a kind of network of private sectors and uh, training centers, universities, all are bringing country together under this uh, platform and identifying the, the skills gaps that faced by employers and then working with, for example, the university and training uh, centers uh, governmental uh, related authorities in order to satisfy uh, to satisfy this uh, need of employers for these skills. Also, for example, we also have right now uh, developing uh, youth employment skills model also in Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan. So this is also kind of new uh, interventions based on that we're working uh, to improve uh, skills mainly for youth and adolescents in order to, uh, to support them to be competitive in the future uh, market, labor market. We have supporting with government also right now, establishing IT parks and all this kind of activity. So considering this kind of opportunity and challenge related to future of work, right now, as I mentioned, it, uh, we are designing and implementing projects where future of work is getting a kind of cross-cutting uh, issue in all our in all our project uh, related, for example, to agriculture, or health, or any kind of, uh, let's say, sectors. Uh, and it's becoming one kind of uh, key, uh, key uh, cross-cutting issue in our program. So this is uh, a very brief uh, related to this uh, topic. And I think if there will be any question, happy to respond. Thank you, Najmuddin, uh, for this uh, nice overview. I know uh, uh, we, are, we are really, uh, both Farooq and I are, are really proud how you came here. And as you said, you were very new to Aga Khan and this market development work was also new and how you took some of the learning and then you called us to Tajikistan and then 
have this very successful programming reaching really hard to reach communities in Tajikistan and also colleagues in, in Afghanistan and Pakistan and the other places. And now uh, hearing from you uh, why uh, future of work topic is so important in terms of building new skills, in terms of bringing different stakeholders and the role you are playing uh, as, as a non-governmental organization working at the national level is, is, is quite uh, um, uh, nice to hear from you. And, and we'll have uh, more question and, and, and we'll bring you in to get some more details about that. Uh, last but not the least, certainly not the least, uh, Fatima. Uh, from uh, International Labour Organization. Fatima, I, I, I uh, waited until the end uh, because you work uh, uh, in an organization that works globally uh, uh, to secure uh, a just future for all workers. So over to you, Fatima. Thank you, Yudosh. Uh, thank you, dear colleagues. colleagues. And uh, nice to be with you here uh, today. Um, so as you present, I'm uh, Fatima, and I am working for the International Labour Organization. Um, uh, first, I would like to, uh, to start by my, my reflection on the course. So um, really, uh, the, my participation on, on this course allows me to be aware or, uh, first about the importance of, uh, of thinking on future of work. Um, and uh, about the, uh, and we we were uh, very lucky because uh, all the material that we had we had uh, during this course was really very relevant, and um, I appreciate also all the exchange that we had with uh, I had with participants. It was really amazing to exchange and um, very very rich uh, uh, exchange between us. Um, uh, also, uh, I would like to emphasize the, the role of Farouk and Yugosh. So uh, really, you, you were very good facilitators. So for us, it was, um, uh, we facilitate all exchange and uh, uh, um, for, for uh, the course. Um, all this uh, ingredient they allows me to uh, to uh, to have an inter uh, interesting experience um, and uh, another value for my for my uh, career and also my work uh, uh, my work now. Um, before to 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 uh, to, uh, to talk about my, my work, I would like to uh, to underline why it is important to have uh, this kind of course. Uh, uh, I, I am sure that uh, uh, most of participants in this webinar today, they are working or contributing in the elaboration of elaboration or implementation of po policy, like a policy on the employment or policy of training. So um, uh, and, uh, when we are in this kind of uh, this, uh, when we have this kind of task, so we have we we have to be really um, aware of of the change that we will have in work in the future. And we have to understand the challenges of future of work in order to, to be able to integrate all these challenges in development of this uh, policy. So it is very important to have this in mind. Um, you, uh, all of you know that most of publication today said that uh, uh, about uh, half of jobs will disappear in, in the few, in the. 15 years uh, in the coming 15 years. So it is important to, to, to think really about the future of work. So um, uh, for me, for me, as, uh, as uh, you guys present, uh, I'm working for International Labour Organization. It is United Nations Agency. If some of you maybe the, uh, cannot know, but uh, ILO is like the same like UNICEF, uh, the UNDP. So it is a United Nations agency uh, who is doing great work uh, over the world with the national government. And the, the role of this agency is to, to provide technical assistance uh, to the national institution in, promo in promoting decent work. So concretely for my work, so uh, I coordinate program on the anticipation of skills at sectoral level in collaboration with our partners in, in Morocco. So I'm based in, uh, in Rabat, which is the capital of Morocco. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I applied for this course because my program, it is about anticipa uh, anticipation of skills. So which is 
uh, really much with with the, the the topic of this course. So um, in my work, we uh, we try to uh, we try to uh, I try to keep in mind uh, all. Uh, uh, this the, uh, this uh, issue of future uh, of work in all uh, process of our work. I explain uh, to you um, uh, we are working at sectoral level, so we we try to do like uh, analysis uh, at sectoral level uh, in collaboration with professional partner and also uh, national institutions. Um, the idea is to est establish vision of, of this sector in the future in. Uh, five coming years and uh, uh, starting from this vision we try to to uh, to uh, to uh, to elaborate what are the, the skills which uh, which are required for to to this vision of sector so the idea is to guide all the training program upgrading upskilling uh, program in order to profile uh, to prepare the profiles that are required for the future of this sector so, um, particularly in the context of, co of COVID-19, um, you, you know that uh, uh, training in the enterprises and uh, uh, all training on digital, on digital tools becomes really, very, very important. So, um, regarding the analysis that we, we, ha we have already done, so we, we have really big change that we, we have to do in the current program uh, of training. So that's, that's uh, what uh, we are doing now. And um, if you want in the, uh, in the discussion, I can give more examples if, uh, if uh, required. Thank you. Thank you, Fatima. Yeah, I will definitely like to learn more about uh, like the strategy for, for employment and for, for skill development. Uh, we have started to uh, get uh, some question and, and we'll, uh, uh, we will get to those uh, questions for sure. We'll try to answer as many as uh, possible. Uh, but before that, we had uh, like a few, few things that came out uh, from the initial uh, uh, introduction by the by the participants. So I'll follow up with one or two questions, and then then we will uh, pick up uh, the questions that are coming up uh, from the audience. So um, Alicia, going back to you, um, you directly work uh, uh, with youth uh, uh, for for employment for their skill development. So can you just tell uh, uh, just like one or two examples? Uh, what challenges uh, uh, you face when you try to connect with with youth? And how do you actually uh, talk uh, with them? And and in terms of uh, skills that you that you talked about, so uh, can can you uh, uh, touch upon a little bit more in terms of uh, what skills um, talk about the transferable skills uh, and other things as well? For sure, for sure. Um... I think the biggest issue that I'm seeing with youth when I'm talking to them, like I said, is that they're overwhelmed by the amount of options um, and they're not quite sure which direction to go in. Um, so what I found useful after thinking about this course and um, thinking about what I've taken away from it, I did a lot of research trying to find um, new tools that work with, um, with where we are right now and where we see things going in the future. Like I said, thinking about things like transfer transferable skills, thinking about things like continuous edu education, like digital literacy. Um, so rather than limiting um, a client and focusing on a job title, which is kind of more traditional career counseling, um, I now try to talk about what type of a challenge in society they might like to work on. So what's a larger driver for them to provide a, a larger direction? Um, and essentially, what I want them to think about is if they could be a small, um, you know, if they could be responsible for a small change in that direction, how would that make them feel? Would it be rewarding? Um, and this approach comes from JP Michael um, for the challenge mindset. It's a, he has a TEDx talk. You can find it on YouTube. It's called Helping Youth Find Purpose and Impact. Um, but I'll give you an example of why I have chosen to use this approach and it's relevant because of the knowledge I gained from this course. Um, I had a client who was a manager at a plant or factory setting. Um, he worked for the same company for in a very small community for about 20 years, but the company closed. And so this man found himself unemployed. 
he was looking around his community and he thought, you know, there's no other large factories that I could work in. So now I either have to move or I have to go back to school. And this man was 52 years old. He didn't really want to retrain. He had no idea what he was going to retrain for, but he was feeling lost and depressed and frustrated and abandoned. And so this is kind of a trend that we've been seeing like we said, with things like COVID, there's been a lot of small businesses forced to close down. There's been a lot of large industry changes. Um, and so this has changed um, the sector that they're working in to change the employment um, landscape that they're experiencing when they go out to work. And so with this gentleman, we sat down together and we talked about what he liked at work. He said, you know what, I really like seeing my employees be happy and healthy at work. You know, I enjoy the challenge of helping people be their best, most happy selves in the workplace. So once we identified that, that was his challenge that he enjoyed working on. We talked about his 20 plus years of transferable skills. A lot of clients don't really stop and think about how many skills they get um, from the job that they're working in. They kind of take that for granted, the fact that they've learned something new, that they have something that they can transfer to a new setting. Um, so with him, we talked about this and he kind of realized, wow, I can get the same level of job satisfaction if I'm able to continue working on this challenge, because this is what I find drives me at work. Um, so he was able to recognize his new skills and take the knowledge he gained in those 20 years in the workforce and transfer them not just to a new factory setting, which is where his mind was limited before because he was limited by his job title, but to so many different workplaces where employers want their employees to be happy and healthy. And that's his driving factor. So with this mindset, it helps clients be able to pick pivot their skill set and know what area drives them. Um, it makes them more resilient. So this client no longer thought of his previous job as a specific title. Like I said, he was now considering the challenge he enjoyed working on, different work environments he may be able to work on those challenges in. And he was thinking of all of his years of skills and experience as now transferable skills that he could switch to a new setting. He had an idea of what direction he wanted to go in, where he wanted to head in, and most importantly, what that created for him was hope for the future. Hope that he could find work again, that he'd be a valuable employee again to a new company, that he could find passion and drive in new opportunities. So I think this is a really important skill to start with for youth, because the future of work and workers, after taking this course, after talking to people, after seeing, um, you know, COVID and, and the effects on the economy, um, I think the future of work and workers is change. So like 50 years ago, it was normal for the average Canadian, for example, to stay in a job for 20 years. But these days, the average is about 2.5 years. And that means the average Canadian would have about 15 jobs in their lifetime. So I think as these things as these things change over time, as we think about the future of work and workers and the land, the economic landscape that they'll be working in, I think it's important for for me as a career counselor to help youth have the ability to adapt. I think that's key. So this is kind of why I focus on the challenge mindset, transferable skills, uh, social skills, continuous learning, um, these types of things that I took away from the course um, when I'm especially when I'm working with with youth in the community. Great. Thank you for highlighting that, uh, Alicia. Very, very important is the, is the ability to learn and, and lifelong learning and why it is such, such a crucial thing going forward. Um, just uh, uh, <clears throat> building on that one, uh, and we have a question as well from, from uh, Priska from Uganda. And I wanted to go back to you, uh, Mansi Ben, if, uh, if you can uh, uh, handle this one. Uh, so the question is, uh, is around equity. So, okay, there is technology uh, we are trying to adopt, but there is issue of, of access and, and inclusion, uh, uh, whether everybody is able to access uh, digital technology. Uh, context is very different. Uh, uh, the question is from Uganda, but, but I know these are the challenges uh, quite general in, 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 in the global south uh, around, around access to uh, technology. So tell us like you working with, uh, with an organization that works with informal sector uh, um, uh, women, and, and many a times they also face the similar challenges around and, and barriers around access to technology, the amount of money you need to access the tools. Uh, so uh, uh, why don't you just say how you are dealing with that and, and, and what are the strategies that are, that are most effective? 
sure thank you yogesh bhai and uh, yes yogesh bhai as you very rightly pointed out access to technology especially in not just access but awareness about technology is also a big challenge when it comes to workers in the global south and our experience working with the uh, women workers from the informal sector for now almost 50 years has shown us that the issues and challenges faced by the women workers across the countries of the global south are more or less similar therefore uh, of course the question is coming from uganda but uh, uh, the situation of the workers in india and uganda is almost similar so yeah and uh, when it comes to access and awareness about technology so as i had mentioned in my pre uh, in my uh, initial uh, talk also uh, acts in awareness about and access to uh, reliable uh, digital technology as well as uh, other technological advancements is a big challenge when it comes to the grassroots sisters also one of the thing that we have uh, noticed uh, we have experienced in our uh, work with the informal sector workers is that uh, the technology that is uh, generally researched that the uh, technology that is generally developed is all geared towards the formal uh, educated uh, sector and very less technology is uh, developed and there is very less investment in research and technology which is uh, pro uh, workers especially uh, pro poor uh, so if I, if i would take an example of the agricultural workers uh, there is very less investment and in research in uh, agri in technology in agriculture which can lead to increasing the input uh, uh, input and uh, in increasing the output and reducing the input cost and whatever technology that is being developed is so expensive and it is so um, un uh, i mean it is so much of labor displacing technology that the poor informal sector workers can hardly take advantage of for example the examples that you had uh, we had seen during our course on in the future of work on the the hydroponics and the um, the Uh, you know the greenhouses where they were vertical farming those are i mean if you look at the examples world over uh, are these uh, these are the technologies which can increase the agricultural output but how many poor small and marginal farmers are able to access this technology and that is exactly why seva wanted to join this course uh, on future of work because we wanted to understand what are the technologies uh, what are the what is the future of work in context of technological advancements and how do we uh, one create awareness about these technologies amongst the poor small and marginal farmers uh, as well as the informal sector workers and two how do we enable them uh, to uh, how do we build their capacities how do we provide them with access uh, and how do we provide them with access to these kind of technologies uh, for example the uh, during the lockdown the current lockdown during the pandemic um, all the uh, uh, all the local i mean all the markets the agro agricultural produce markets had closed down and the uh, the small and marginal farmers especially the vegetable growers were in a really difficult Difficult situation because vegetables have a very less shelf life. Uh, the local transportation was all disrupted. Uh, the small and marginal farmers do not have enough volume that they can, uh, you know, hire their own vehicle and take their produce to a larger market, which is uh, far away. And uh, uh, the smaller, I mean, in the local area, because uh, there are a lot of small and marginal farmers who are having similar produce in a village, uh, the local markets were flooded. with the produce and therefore there was no market almost there were no customers no buyers so if in that in such situation if we are able to bring in technology if we are able to bring in blockchain if we are able to bring in digital platforms uh, where these uh, where uh, these uh, small and marginal farmers could aggregate their produce and sell it digitally online uh, how do they uh, use gig and platform economies to you know uh, reach out directly to customers bypass the middleman and thereby strengthen their agriculture these are the kinds of uh, technologies which are needed uh, at seva it has been our experience that technology when um, 
technology when given in the hands of the poor they know exactly how to use it but how do you make them aware of the technology and how do you give it to them in their hands so on these lines uh, uh, i mean the small and marginal farmers whom i just mentioned about during the pandemic uh, so seva uh, worked with whatsapp and we designed a whatsapp uh, chatbot and a group uh, uh, on which all these uh, about 150 small and marginal vegetable growers onboarded and uh, we uh, linked uh, those farmers directly to the customers in the urban areas and uh, therefore uh, the customers would place their orders about for the what are their vegetable requirements for the next day the farmers would pluck only those amounts of vegetables and those would be aggregated at village level and seva then uh, worked with the local governments to organize transportation so the transport uh, the vegetables plucked by the farmers and aggregated at village level were picked up by the vehicles and delivered to the doorstep of the uh, urban customers due to this the farmers were able to build the resilience against the economic crisis the urban customers were able to get access to fresh uh, organic vegetable supply and we were able to eliminate the middleman so this is how simple technologies like whatsapp uh, using which are inexpensive but if they are uh, if the workers are trained on how to use them can be used to the benefit of the customer so this is just an example what is needed now is there is a need for research into labor augmenting technology and there is a need for capacity building of the grassroots workers and awareness creation about the new technologies that are coming in contextual awareness creation it's not just you tell them there is ai there is blockchain there is digital 3d printing but how can you apply this ai in your trade how can you apply ai to understand the weather changes and plan your cropping pattern so that your uh, crop becomes climate resilient these are the kind of awareness creation that is needed and that is how that is what we uh, we uh, hope to do with taking the learnings from this course and adapting it so as to be helpful to our members i hope i have answered the question to the ugandan question Yes, yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mansi Ben. I think we have somebody from the region, uh, uh, Tadale. If if you can still hear us, uh, 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 I know you uh, are also uh, um, uh, as as a research organization working on on leading uh, technologies in in agriculture, use of artificial intelligence and all. But how do you actually translate some of this uh, uh, to the smallholder farmers in 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 the region? uh what what are the models what are the tools you use to transfer this this knowledge so that it actually is is beneficial to the to the smallholder farmer yeah uh yeah uh, the is uh, we are using the agricultural extension system which is uh, existing in the government and all farmers have a mobile application which is available to everyone uh the farmers uh, are aware how they can get all the required information from from the ministry of agriculture and at the same time we can collect the needed information from from the mobile which is automated in that case so this is mainstreaming and the farmers are aware and we can also take uh, uh, the important information from the server that's how uh, we are getting the required information from the farmer so that mm -hmm. the farmer are aware and they're ready to protect uh, the health of the plant mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you uh, uh, and and also in terms of uh, the the access to uh, the question was around access to uh, the mobile phone as well uh, so in terms of connectivity and the costs uh, involved in 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 getting connected to a, a network and and having a mobile phone i think that was it was more uh, around that as well so are there strategies for for addressing that challenge yes yogesh uh, nowadays i think uh, most farmers are uh, uh, have have uh, inter not in it, it doesn't require internet connection it's only required uh, the telecom communication so in most of the rural area nowadays have we have uh, telephone communication so it doesn't require internet connection that's uh, how we we are we are getting the required information yeah 
thank you. Thank you, Tadale. Um, there's one question for, for Najmuddin, um, and I think it's, this one is from, from your old colleague uh, from Afghanistan. So uh, uh, he is asking, um, uh, what do you do as a as Aga Khan um, a network? Uh, uh, do you include a refugee as part of your uh, strategy to support skill development? Yeah, interesting question also for me. So, so far I couldn't say yes or no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this could be kind of a new kind of challenge for Tajikistan and uh, due to the situation in Afghanistan. And uh, uh, so far actually for me, or if I don't, I don't have any kind of message related to supporting refugees. And mm -hmm. so far even to Tajikistan, there's no any kind of such kind of uh, big issue so far. And uh, what I understand, and uh, so far, actually, I think the Kagadin, the Kagadin uh, perspective to this issue is so far is trying to build kind of opportunities for the, in Afghanistan, for the targeted communities there to support communities. But probably if the situation is changing in the uh, near future and future, so probably there will be some kind of uh, project related to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, <clears throat> So I think uh, uh, going back to uh, the, the skills question, uh, Fatima, I think in your introduction, you had talked about uh, uh, the work that you are uh, doing uh, for ILO in, uh, in Morocco. Can you just tell us uh, a little bit about uh, the, uh, the employment uh, strategy? I think you did a review. What were some of the key, key lessons around, around strategy for, for, for skills and, and employment uh, generation? Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Yogos. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, the, the, the most lesson that we had, uh, and I think it's uh, something that is uh, very common to other countries, that um, we have, uh, we have um, really, uh, we, 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 we have a really uh, big issue that uh, the supply of, of, of skills of skills uh, by, by educational institution uh, the not match with the needs of labor market and this and this issue it uh, it is um, it um, it results on high social and economic costs and uh, <laughs> uh, or, uh, also by employment of youth, youth people so this is uh, this is the, the the main lesson and uh, also we had that um, this employment strategy, it is elaborated without integrating all the partners that are concerned by, the, uh, by this, uh, by this uh, strategy and uh, particularly uh, professional partner. A professional partner are more aware by the future of the, their sector. So they know more than the others um, what is the evolution and the, the trend of their, um, of their sector and what are the skills that are needed for the future. The, all, all of these elements have to be integrated in the uh, employment, uh, employment uh, strategy. So um, that's to, to uh, uh, only to, to highlight that um, uh, the issue of future of work is something that's very important that all uh, makers of uh, policies have to um, they, they have to to have it in their mind uh, in order to to make a good strategy uh, a good strategy who, that um, uh, answer to all needs of uh, of uh, of uh, people thank you thank you uh, thank you, Fatima. Uh, there was a question, uh, I think, by, uh, by Laurie around, uh, do we cover uh, uh, something around worker organizing unions in our course? Yes. I think uh, the whole history of the, of the Cody Institute um, um, and how we, we came about is started with an with a, with a economic and, and, and social uh, um, justice movement uh, called Antigonish movement. So that's how uh, our history is. So yes. That aspect we cover uh, uh, in the course, uh, actually throughout the course. Uh, so Farooq, you want to talk a little bit about how we actually begin uh, on that one and, and yeah. Absolutely, and I think when we were designing the course, you know, Yogesh and I really felt it was important if we're gonna talk about the future of work and workers, 
first we need to understand the history of work and workers. And so we actually start with you know, the pre-industrial revolution or prior to the first industrial revolution. And then we kind of chart out what happened during the three and a half or, or four, depending on how you're counting them, industrial revolution in terms of how the nature of work itself has changed, but also what was happening to workers at different stages along the way. And that's a very neat way for us to then help to contextualize the emergence of the labor movement, understand the role of unions have played, and why we are working in the way that we are working today. So for example, where a lot of our labor laws came from, why labor laws are structured in the way that they are today. We talk about some of the, you know, the ups and downs, whether it was union busting, other challenges that happened in the past, because a lot of this still plays out e even, even today. When we're looking at people who are in the gig economy and trying to organize, there has been a lot of pushback from, from various organizations, various sectors, to not allow people to unionize still. It's, it's a very live conversation, whether it's the, the, the fight for 15, $15 an hour minimum wage. We talk about all of those things. When it comes to the question of what the role is going to be in the future, you know, we, we don't have a crystal ball. So what we try and do is bring people who are leaders in the space to be part of the conversation. And we, we, we do some reflection with them. We ask them what they think it's going to look like as the very nature of work changes, as work is more fragmented, as people have more than one role in more than one job in their lives, as they uh, move more and more towards this uh, idea of being in the gig economy, what is the role going to be of, of labor unions, of, of organized labor? And it's a question that I actually want to ask our participants as well. You know, as you, as you think about, you know, this from your own perspectives, whether you're at the ILO or you're at SEWA or, you know, you're at AKDN or wherever else you are, what do you think is going to happen with how people are going to organize themselves to ensure that they have the, the rights, the, 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 the wins that they have uh, earned so far are, are not taken away from them? I don't know whether you're beginning to see a little bit of this, you're reflecting on this a little bit more since the course. Um, maybe I'll start with Alicia and then we can we can go around the table if that's okay. Oh, sorry, couldn't get myself unmuted. Um, yeah, I think uh, when, when I'm talking to clients nowadays, uh, like I said, I'm on a very one-on-one um, -on -one level with clients, um, with, with employees. And for them, I think, they're seeing less of those opportunities, like we said, to be in the positions that their grandparents and their that their great parent grandparents were in, um, that had that stability of providing the, the pension plans, the benefits, the health care um, that they're used to seeing, and they're moving more so towards um, independent contracts, um, positions where they're responsible for saving up their own money um, to invest in their retirement, to invest in their health care um, to pay their own taxes and so this is a trend that people um, on the ground are seeing already and I think it's important for us to think about where like you said where this could take us but I don't know that that is um, I don't know that's necessarily back to uh, a union like you said there's been a lot of pushback from um, from people um, in regards to unionized environments lately and so it might be more so um, organizing on a more informal level or organizing um, by by doing more so like savings and investments of money um, pre-planning um, yeah I, I think like I said, I, I'd love to see something like a more social structure um, come into play. But I think from my level with one on one with people, I'm seeing currently a lot of people who are having to do that on their own, who are having to plan for the future and who are having to um, to put aside their own their own money without that security that, that we used to see from from a from a more stable unionized environment. Thank you, Alicia. And maybe I'll, I'll take the same question to Mansi Ben, because I mean, Mansi Ben, you, you've been dealing with this for such a long time. For a lot of people, this is a new con conversation about, you know, how do you organize labor? How do you, how do you push back so that employees or people who, who are um, providing the labor in whatever context have those rights and privileges, have some level of security? You've been dealing with this in the informal sector for a very long time. What, what are your thoughts on this question? 
so farooq bhai thank you and yes uh, that is uh, this is actually a one big concern that all the unions of the world are facing uh, uh, they are uh, their their whole existence their whole uh, uh, is under a big question now uh, and that is because of the the increasing uh, gig work or the informal uh, kind of the contract work that is happening nowadays and therefore uh, a lot of unions uh, world over and uh, for example the international trade union confederation ituc and they are all uh, are doing a lot of uh, uh, brainstorming and dis discussions on how do you how do how does the unions uh, how do the unions change their organizing strategy so currently the all uh, the uh, most of the unions in at present were focusing on one of the employ uh, i mean uh, Uh, workers in one uh, specific location like one corporate or maybe one trade so if it is like uh, railways so it's all the railway workers or if it is a uh, in uh, mining then all the mining but now uh it it has to be more of a campaign based and more of uh, uh, what are the what are the various issues and challenges and then a need based organizing has to uh, come up so that is one of the key things as also uh, uh, however uh, our experience working with the informal sector has shown that uh, the workers now although the gig economy seems very uh, lucrative at uh, at an outset uh but actually speaking it is a uh, very difficult and it is going to put the workers especially the uh, small and marginal uh, workers i mean the uh, in uh, are they are going to be in a really difficult vulnerable and precarious situation and that is mainly uh, especially the unskilled or medium skilled workers they are going to be in very difficult situation and that is because um, uh, without organizing you do not have a collective strength and when you are not having a formal employer employee relationship uh, your fight for your rights it as a systemic level and to bring about a change at a systemic level there is a need for a collective strength and therefore it is very important now for the workers of the informal sector to come together and to organize uh, organizing was and organizing is the key thank you manthi ben i don't know i'm going to take the same question back to nadwadeen fatima to dele if you have any thoughts any reflections on this i know your contexts are very different so i'll i'll just open it up if there is anything you want to say uh yes uh, farooq so uh for the unions um uh, before, before um uh, i think that your question um the the answer will be different before the pandemic but now after the covid-19 pa pandemic uh the answer that unions they are um uh, if uh, may i say that they are obliged to review their strategy and their approach because they they see of uh, themselves that the, the the work is changing and um uh, of course they have to change also their their approach they they are now they, they become uh, more aware that uh, uh work we 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 are uh, We are going for uh, gig economy. We are going for flexibility of work in the inter enterprise. Before they they were again against this this kind of work. They they said that uh, we cannot accept flexibility. I'm I'm um, flexibility of work. I'm talking about um, the case of Morocco. Uh, they they uh, they still uh, on on the work classic that uh, enterprise cannot do. Uh, kind of um, a short contract or something like that so they they were they were uh, they cannot accept this before the pandemic but now the the thing are changing so um, they becoming more aware of change of work and they 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 have to be more organized uh, as uh, mansi said to uh, because we have a lot of issues now uh, now and the the big issue is to maintain the work the job the work so uh, and the uh, and the unions uh, have to work on, on this thank you fantastic thank you and i just wanted to echo one of the the, the points that uh, alicia had made earlier on which is you know one of the things that we've been observing since we completed the course in december is 
just how the, the market system is responding to play the role of the labor unions or provide services that the labor unions did in different ways. We're seeing, for example, insurance companies beginning to provide you know, structured insurance products for people who are in the gig economy. Um, we're seeing uh, a lot of the financial institutions stepping up and providing different ways in which they're able to gauge and assess your mortgage qualifications based on the kind of work that you had. A lot of the things that were very were, were designed for people who had you know, structured long-term employment and where the unions played a very important role in guaranteeing a lot of those things, different market actors are beginning to spot the opportunity and are beginning to, to play a role in, in terms of how they can, uh, they can help with this. And I, it mean, I don't mean to suggest that they're helping to organize the workers in any way or anything like that, but I think it'd be interesting to explore how these platforms, which are today taking the work and you know, um, spreading it around the world can also be used as a platform for organizing. So whether it's Fiverr or whichever the platforms there are out there, where employers are able to take the tasks that they have and spread them to wherever the labor and, the, and the, the, the talent is available around the world could potentially be used as platforms for the future for organizing as well. Um, I do want to say one other thing with regard to the course. If you, if you kind of think about it from you know, the way Yogesh and I were thinking about how we would design something, we said, let's start with the history of how work has come to be the way it is right now. Let's look at the industrial revolution. Let's look at the history of how workers have come to be the way they are right now. And then we've invested a fair amount of time trying to demystify these key technology pillars. I think Mansi Ben mentioned it very briefly, but I want to just emphasize it again. We need for people to understand that, you know, um, artificial intelligence, deep learning, machine learning is very, very critical in how it actually plays a role in so many different ways. We need for you, <clears throat> as, as people who are leaders in your community to understand what those things mean. If you know you think you are in Uganda and blockchain is not going to affect you in any way, we try to explain how it already is and how it will continue to, to, to become more and more relevant, more and more visible in, in your world. We also talk about things like robotics and 3D printing and how that's going to change you know, um, agricultural value chains and food systems, how it's gonna change global supply chains so that you have a better understanding of where the future is going to be. And then what we felt was equally important was to deal with those big questions regarding um, climate change, with, regarding migration and, uh, and, the, and the, the shifting nature of work. We spent some time talking about the question of a just transition. How do we make sure that the future is better in terms of uh, um, ensuring there is better diversity, equity, and inclusion than perhaps the past or even the present has been. And for all of these things, because we don't have any answers, our, our objective has been to try and bring people in and have an honest conversation, do a bit of reflection, some introspection, so we can surface those issues. We're, we're not, we haven't designed the course so that it provides you with all of the answers. Some of them, yes, we're here to deepen your knowledge or try and um, sharpen the edges of what you might already know. But sometimes our objective is just to make sure that you have those things front of mind. Alicia was talking about the question of soft skills, the things that are really important for you to learn, whether it's lifelong, life, lifelong learning, problem solving, um, creativity, all of those things which we believe are critical regardless of where the future of work is going to be are some of those layers that we have built into the course. Our objective as facilitators is to do exactly that. We're here to facilitate. We're here to provide the space and the opportunity for there to be co-learning, for mutual learning, and for everybody to bring their experiences together and share them in different ways. If you're working in an organization in Nova Scotia, I think you might be surprised by what you might learn from a labor union of informal workers in India. And if you're working you know, in the middle of Tajikistan, you may, might be surprised to find that you know, the lesson from somebody in Ethiopia really applies to you in ways that you hadn't considered before. And that's really our role more than anything else. Anyway, I just wanted to throw that in for the people who are, who are joining us and are kind of on the fence about whether they want to join this course or not. I hope we can nudge you to, to, to come join us. Yeah. No, and, and just to add, this is exactly what happened in the course as well, right? The way we look at our economies, uh, uh, we say that uh, maybe 70 to 80 percent of the economies are, are informal uh, in places like sub-Saharan Africa, uh, in, in South Asia. And if we come back here, uh, North America is still about 10 percent of the economy is informal. But as we see more and more gig work happening here, 
people want those short jobs or, or people are getting those short jobs which are there's no full time job so the 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 that work is getting more and more flexible more and more informal so um while before there were uh, there was job security there was pension there was worker security social security but with work getting um, uh, more and more uh, gig in, in in nature what happens to that and 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 how do workers organize for that now in the in the global south in the developing world that was the norm i mean the informal sector workers never had social uh, protection never had social security that's why they had to organize so uh, and and here we never heard of um, um, informal sector organizing in the context of uh, global north so there are a lot of learning how how the organizing happens in uh, in in informal uh, sector so that, that that kind of learning actually is possible um, in a classroom in a global classroom like this um, uh, Fatima there was one more question and then I think uh, we will wrap up we'll give you uh, like uh, one minute each to wrap up but there's one question and I don't know Fatima if you will have the answer right away or if this is your area of focus at ILO what is the migration strategy of ILO in the South Asia region Um, in fact, I'm not specialist on immigration, but uh, for the for the ILO, there is uh, no strategy for migration in in any uh, any uh, area. The the mission or of ILO is to to provide technical assistance to the government to uh, to uh, to implement their strategy. So this is uh, of course in respect to the decent work. This is the the main the main role of the of the ILO. Thank you. Okay. Thank and, you. And uh, for more information, the participants who ask for this question can go to the website of the ILO. They can uh, find the. Thank you. Okay. Uh, unless you have something else to add, uh, Farouk, I'll ask the final question and and we'll wrap up. No, go for it. Yeah. So just one question to each one of you. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, for actually participating and, and sharing your experience uh, of the course and, and how you applied the learning. Uh, so one question and then then uh, you can uh, give your concluding thoughts. We have uh, yeah, about uh, seven minutes left. So would you would you recommend uh, this course to to anybody else? Should they take it? Yes, and, and then you can give your concluding thoughts and, and, and we will end. Absolutely, Yogesh Bhai, sorry. I, I was just, I'm not sure. I mean, uh, I, I see uh, Tedele has, uh, has his hand up, but I just jumped in. Uh, uh, so, so uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that I would absolutely recommend people to take this course uh, for two major reasons. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning itself, there are uh, the, these new technologies, uh, AI, blockchain, 3D printing, gig economy, uh, the whole history of uh, how technology and the work and uh, how it evolved, the whole thing. We, we uh, in our day-to-day -day work, we, uh, we hear about all these things very frequently. But it is very rarely that we would have actually sat and heard up, uh, read about it or heard about all these things. And therefore, uh, when uh, through this course, one you get an one one you get an insight into all these things, which helps you understand the context of why the situation is uh, what it is currently and how it is going to evolve, how it has evolved, and it will set the trend for how it is going to evolve in future. And secondly, uh, when you understand the technologies in uh, detail, uh, uh, how uh, although it is uh, although it is not it might not be exactly related to your work, but you can understand how the technologies are uh, evolving, how the technologies are addressing the issues, and uh, it will give you it will. Um, it will uh, provide you with a, a, a rich environment to think how you can apply these kind of new technologies in your area and how you can improve or build the resilience of your uh, trade. So I would 100% recommend this course. And uh, uh, to top it all off, uh, uh, Yogesh Bhai and Farooq Bhai are excellent 
uh, guide, uh, friend, philosopher. They conduct the course really well. So it's uh, it's a cherry on the icing. <laughs> Adela, you, you want to go? You had your hand up? Yes, uh, Yogesh, thank you. Absolutely, uh, I recommend this course, to be honest. Uh, for me, I personally, uh, it, this is the course that opened my eyes. I never uh, uh, assumed that having like the current, my uh, educational experience was enough for me. But after having this course, <laughs> It's completely different. Like, uh, I mean, graduating in the Master of Business does not make sense for tomorrow because that's what I learned exactly from this course. Because learning, uh, it's, it's, the curve has to be increasing day after day because as, as the technology is developing and uh, really this course shapes my, my personal uh, uh, development and organizational uh, development as well. So absolutely, I recommend for, for those of you uh, who are not yet uh, take this course, uh, I really highly recommend to take because it's, it's very helpful. And at the same time, uh, many thanks to Yogesh and Farouk uh, for, for your excellent facilitation on the classroom and inviting those uh, well-experienced guest speakers uh, during the course. It's, it's, it's not a theoretical course, actually. This, is, this course is exceptional because more of practical. And uh, that helps uh, people and organization to implement and to come up with a novel idea in, in the next step. And at the same time, the materials that uh, you put in the Moodles are really much appreciated in that short period of time and very helpful. And uh, uh, really it can be transferable to uh, the next generation. And uh, for me, this course really is will shape our future and make a better tomorrow. And I advise everyone uh, to take this course. And uh, for my colleagues from Ethiopia, I wish you have a fabulous new year. On Saturday, we have Ethiopian new year. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tarle. Uh, I see uh, Najmuddin. Yeah, you wish absolutely. I also recommend this um, training course, as I already mentioned, due for several reasons. As I already mentioned, it, like uh, for EKF is also future focus kind of new initiatives. And uh, as I mentioned, after this training for us was a lot of other issues that we had uh, kind of questions. Now it's clear and right now we know that the way that we are going We are on the right, right way, and uh, important to know this kind of things. There's no kind of technology, and like for example, in the past we heard a lot about uh, blockchain, about, about uh, artificial intelligence. But through this training, right now we understand how they are important and how they influence in future uh, development, and all these are important. For example, if there are we uh, say uh, smartphone or smart fee, so it's coming for uh, future smart home, smart cities. So this training, all kind of uh, important information provides that's how important this topic in very kind of uh, near future. So definitely I recommend it. I recommended it for my colleagues and some of my colleagues already applied. Uh, to the next upcoming training and hopefully if they are lucky they will be accepted to this training and of course ex uh, recommended it for others as well. Thank you. Thank you Najmuddin. Uh, Fatima? Hello? Uh, yes. So uh, in my turn uh, I recommend this course because uh, first the facilitators are very kind and very reactive. It was very a uh, good point for us in the, in the to follow the course. Uh, and also the material is very relevant and uh, very useful also for our work. Uh, the second thing, as Najmeddin said, that all, all of things as, uh, is becoming smart. 
so we need to to understand <laughs> so for for me really when we when we talked about the fourth revolution industrial revolution it is very scaring me so we need, we need to uh, to uh, to understand more all of this and um, as the world is uh, is changing, there, there are a lot of challenges that we we have to understand uh, to take them more in our uh, into in consideration in our in our work and also in our personal life. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Alicia, we started with you and we'll end with you. <laughs> I'll keep it short and sweet. I know we're close on time here. Um, I think for myself as a counselor, it's important for me to practice what I preach. And for my clients, I'm, you know, after taking this course, I'm telling them continuous education is so important, knowing what's going on, understanding um, the the economy and what you're going into um, is so important. And so for me, obviously, um, taking a course like this and being able to grow on a personal as well as a professional uh, level, as Tadele mentioned, um, it is very important. And I can pass this on to my colleagues. And for sure, I'll be encouraged them to take it two thumbs up on the course um it was a great experience and really great discussions um getting like you said to hear perspectives from all over the world has really grown uh, my ability to work with my clients and to help them understand uh local current global and future trends it was a great course thank you thank you everyone uh uh thanks again uh mansi ben uh fatima najbuddin alicia and Chadale. Really appreciate you joining us back and hope to see you during the course again. So we might call you again uh, to do one of those sessions that we had where we invite uh, guest speakers. So thank you. Sure. Thank you once again. Thank you so much, Yogesh. Bye. Thank you. Thank Farum. you. Bye. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Jamie. Ben. Bye. 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 Have a great Bye. day, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you all.